Well, before we get on to the bulk of the topic, I got to share with you uh, something that wasn't one of my proudest moments. And it was actually the very first fight uh, I ever got into. Uh, I was actually, you know, as a young boy, my mum and dad, like, they would send me to taekwondo and karate. That's why I was able to kick really high before falling on my bum. But I wasn't really strong at all, you know. I was like a real skinny kid, and, and I didn't like fighting. I didn't want to fight. Now, when I was 13, I made that catastrophic shift from junior high, we call it primary school, right, to high school. And when we did that, there was a lot of public school kids who also came into high school with us because their parents wanted them to graduate from a Catholic school, but they didn't want to have to pay for their kids to go all the way from, you know, grade one up. Who could blame them? It was quite expensive. But me and my Catholic school friends were all pretty sure that public school kids, you know, smoke crack and worship Satan. <laughs> so we were a little nervous about meeting them for the first time, you know, like, because we were at the top of primary school, you know, we were the big kids, and now all of a sudden we're little, and you got all these public school kids coming in. I was really nervous. I remember the first or second day, it was in English class. And I was sitting down, minding my own business, and one of these little public school kids looked at me, and he said, Oi. <laughs> Thanks, guys. He went, That feels real good. He went, Oi, I want to fight you. But he was. 12, so he went, oi, <laughs> I want to fight you. Not as intimidating. And I said, why? And he said, because I don't like you. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so we agreed to meet at a park up the road from my house after school. And I looked at him, and I'm like, I think I could take him, you know? And so I was walking home from school that day, amping myself up. I'd like pick up these sticks, you know, and I'm like, this is Mark before the fight, Poof, that's him after the fight, you know? <laughs> Super manly, hey? I felt like if I had Karate Kid on my like cassette, you know, back before they had DVDs, I totally would have went home, watched it, and was just pumped myself up. So while I was waiting, getting ready for 4 p.m., a friend of mine, his name was Eric, he rode his bike over to my house because he agreed that he would come with me to this fight. So I got on my bike, he was on his bike, and we rode up to this park about two minutes away from my house. And I'm waiting there, I'm getting ready, I've got all these dreams about how this fight's going to go. I don't know what that was. Stop it, that's your fault, not mine. That was me grabbing him in the heart ripping it out. Anyway, he didn't show up. Mark didn't show up. And so I'm thinking, I guess I'm just going to go home because we were there for like 30 minutes. And my friend Eric says, hey, I know where he lives. Let's just go to his house. You know that's a stupid idea. But I was 13. I'm like, yeah, totally. What happens is if his mum answers the door? Hello, Mrs. Sullivan. I want to hurt your child. <laughs> what do you say? I don't know what you say. So I got on my little BMX bike. That's me riding it. Rode over to Mark, his name was, Mark's house. Knocked on the door. And Mark answered it. And the next thing that happened just shocked me. He ran away. Now, you're probably thinking, OK, he ran back into the house. No. He ran past me. I'm at the front door. What are you doing? And I was like, oh, hey, hey, Mark. And he, he ran. I'm like, that's totally weird. But I mean, he's running away from me. That's probably a good sign. So I start following him, you know. And what happened was he was going into the next lot over from his house, which wasn't another house, but actually a park, a small park that was surrounded by trees. I'm thinking, all right, sweet. And so me and Eric, you know, we kind of put our bikes down and we're walking into this little park. And as we do, about four or six grade 12 senior students all come out. And they're not on my side. This was a setup. And I just start getting really scared. I don't know if you've gotten into a fight and you feel scared and then you feel sick. You're like, don't throw up. 
<laughs> You'll be the laughing stock <laughs> of high school forever. Um, I was really nervous, you know, and so all of a sudden I'm saying stuff like, oh, nah, man, like, I didn't want to fight him. Real manly, huh? Nah, dude, I was just coming to say hi. You know, I want to ride some BMX bikes or something. So they start surrounding me and Mark and pushing us into each other, like really hard. And I didn't know what to do, and I was really scared, and so I did what I did last night to any. <laughs> I just was like, yeah! And I threw up my foot like that. I didn't know if it connected, but everyone thought it was really weird. So they were like, whoa! And there was a break in the circle. And so I dodge out of that group, and I get on my BMX bike. I ride home as quickly as I could. I was so afraid that they were gonna come after me. Now, as I'm going home, I, you know, I'm getting really nervous, I'm scared. I get home and I realize it's like the second day of high school and I just ran away from a fight. That's not a good thing. Like, people are gonna make fun of me now forever. So the next day when I woke up, I tried to pretend I was sick. I was like, hey, mum. <coughs> really sick, eh? That never worked. No, you're not, go to school, righto. Now, in Australia, we don't have, you know how you guys have big hallways and all of your schooling sort of under big shelter, you know? We, we don't have that because it's always, you know, hot weather. So um, our lockers were outside, they're not inside. And so my mum dropped me off and I'm standing by my locker outside with my backpack waiting for the abuse to begin. But it didn't come. You see, because a different version of that story started circulating. Apparently, my foot had connected with Mark's face. <laughs> and so I'm really scared, and this guy comes up to me, and I'm getting real defensive, about to make up some line about why I had to go home, you know? And he's like, is it true what they're saying? What do you mean? <laughs> Apparently, they were like, you know, you were just like, whatever. And then all of a sudden, you went friggin' psycho. You kicked him in the face and went, I'm done here, and you, and you rode home. Is that, is that what happened? Yeah. That's, that is what happened. So I was the hero of my school for like a day. You know, I love reading scripture, and I love when old ladies at Sunday school try to make stories in the Bible that really aren't appropriate for kids, appropriate for kids, right? Like the story of David and Goliath. Speaking of fights, fight scenes, that has gotta be my most, one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Now you're probably familiar with it, but let me go over it again, because in this one, David was a hero and he didn't run away to his mum, like I did. So basically, you've got the Israelites, huh? And the greatest army threat against the Israelites were the Philistines. And the Philistines assembled their armies together on the side of a mountain. And they're declaring war on Israel. Now, when I used to think of this story, I used to think of this big flat piece of land with the Philistines on one side and the Israelites on the other. But that's not what scripture says. It says this, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. The valley between them. So you can imagine that. You've got a mountain over here, a big valley, and a mountain over here. You've got the Philistine armies over here, and you've got the Israel armies over here. This stare-off goes for weeks. Weeks and nothing's happening. Why? Well, because of what I just said. If you were to make the first move, what would that entail? It would entail going down into the valley and coming up where you would be completely exposed. So not much was happening. Now, during this time, David, King David, who wrote many of the Psalms, was just a shepherd boy. He was in charge of looking after the sheep for his parents. One day, his parents ask him to take lunch to his three older brothers who are soldiers in the army of Israel, which is totally a little brother thing to do, right? Take him your sandwiches, good boy, you know? So he's going off, right? 
And when he gets there, he encounters something. You see, there was this somewhat of a tradition in the ancient Near East called single combat. Now, single combat would occur as a way to uh, settle one's disputes with an opposing army without unnecessary bloodshed. And so the Philistines say, okay, since nothing's happening, it's been weeks, you know, we'll send out our biggest warrior, you send out your most mighty warrior, they'll fight. We beat you, you become our slaves. Hmm? You beat us, we become your slaves. And it was agreed to. And Goliath came out. Now, Goliath is six foot nine, a giant of a man, clad in copper from head to toe, huge javelin, sword, beard. The man is absolutely terrifying. And we read that all of the Israelites were terrified of him. No one wanted to fight him. It was a hopeless cause. Now, all of a sudden, you've got little David the shepherd who comes up, he's given his lunches to his brother, you know, and he hears what's going on. He hears this Philistine blaspheming the one true God. And he says, What's going on? I love the cockiness of like young men, you know, like, I'll take him on. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do something good and people have suspected the worst of you. You've tried to do something good, something brave, something noble, and men much weaker than you accuse you because they can't handle the fact that your motives might be pure. And that's what we read here. We read that the eldest brother uh, when he heard him spoke, um, his anger was kindled against his young brother David. And he said, why, ha um, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil in your heart. And he's like, dude, I was just saying, I'll, I'll take him on. That's really all I was saying, you know. You got the shepherd boy. So, David goes up to King Saul, who's in charge of the armies of Israel, and he's like, I will defeat that Philistine. And you can imagine Saul, I mean, he's the king, all these men are cowards, and they feel really weak, you know, because it's really, you know, really um, easy to seem strong, isn't it? Like, before, when we were all singing, I love Jesus, how about you? Like, what if, like, a terrorist came in and I'm like, I will shoot you if you say it? Most of us would be like, <laughs> crap. All of a sudden, maybe, maybe, I'm sure there'd be a lot of many of you who wouldn't do that, but all of a sudden, our weakness is exposed, right? And you've got all these armies of Israel whose weakness has been exposed. None of them want to take on Goliath. So you can imagine Saul almost feeling like, well, this is cute, but you're not going to do that. And here's what David said. He's like, look, when I guarded my family's sheep, I would often have to take down a lion or a wolf who would try to come after these sheep. The same thing I did to those wild beasts, I will do to that uncircumcised Philistine. David says, let no man's heart fall, fail because of him. All right, now I wanna to read to you this section here. First of all, it's quite cute, right? David's got nothing. Saul gives him all of his armor. He puts it on him. There you go, you're gonna need that. And David's like, nah, get it off. It's too big, too clunky, it gets in the way. I don't need it, I don't need it. The confidence he had, not in himself, but in what God was about to do. And he ran down to the river and he picks up five smooth stones, we read. Let me read these next few verses to you. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and attractive in appearance. I mean, you are this giant, ferocious friggin' warrior. And out comes this boy. You'd be insulted. Are you kidding me? And so Goliath says, 
Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? That's the staff that David's carrying. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, woo baby. You know that there's like totally intense music in the background at this point. You come to me with a sword and a javelin and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Notice that David doesn't come in his own name. He comes in the name of the God of Israel. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, cut off your head. Don't remember reading that in Sunday school. (laughs) And I will give, right, so I'll cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, by the way, just imagine the mood that's taking place in the Philistine camp, right? And then the mood that's taking place in the Israel camp, right? I mean, the Philistines must be like, oh, yes! Like, we're going to totally dominate them. They're all going to be our slaves. Meanwhile, you've got the Israelites like, oh, gosh, this is probably a bad idea. This is, you tell mum, I didn't let him do it. That's a stupid idea, right? (laughs) When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it. (laughs) That's supposed to be a heartbeat. Um, And struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone, I love this bit, sank into his forehead. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, didn't bounce off, sunk into. And he fell on his face (laughs) to the ground. So David, it gets better. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. So then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, it must have been a massive sword for David to lift, drew it out of its sheath and cut his head off. Do you remember reading that when you were a kid? Now, you've got to be thinking, like, imagine the expression on the Philistines' face, right? The Philistine army, because they're like, yeah! Oh, no! This isn't good. Like, if this is what the weakest of their members has to offer, let's go, guys! And they were taken out completely by the Israel army. We men love that story. And we love that story because we do identify with David. There are things in your life and there are things in my life that genuinely feel like that. And we wish that we had the courage to combat them, to overcome them once and for all so that we could finally be the sort of man God's calling us to be, but we're afraid. And so when we hear a story like that, everything within us resonates. This is a personal question which I'd like you to meditate on in your own mind and heart. Don't say it out loud. But what are your Goliaths? There are giants in your life that are preventing you from becoming who God wants you to be. Again, that quote I read to you from C.S. Lewis last night. What did he say? When we consider the unblushing promises of reward in the Gospels, it seems like Christ finds our desires not too strong but too weak. He wants to call those desires forth so we can be fully alive, the sorts of men that we want to be. 
Let me prove that to you, can I, in case some of you are still doubting. I wanna ask you a couple of questions and I want you to think about them. Be very honest as you answer these. Don't think, what would mum want me to say or what does Matt want me to say, what would Jesus have me say? Be brutally honest, no one needs to know, okay? First question, what kind of man do you wanna be? Second question, what, what men do I respect? Fictional or not, living or dead, what men do I respect? Finally, how do I wanna be remembered when I'm dead? Now, if you answered those questions seriously, I think I've proven my point. And my point was this, who you and I want to be is who God is commanding that we be. God's commandments toward us don't require, as I said earlier, for us to repress our deepest desires, but instead issue them forth. I am willing to bet money that no one in here, when you said, what kind of man do I wanna be? You're like, dude, I wanna be the kind of guy who never stood up for what he believes then. Like, unless you're drunk, right? And if you are, you know, you shouldn't be, stop it. But right, like, we don't say those sorts of things. Or how do I wanna be remembered? Like, dude, I wanna be remembered as the guy who, who wasn't just a little interested in porn, but was like super, super addicted. Like, I, I want people to know that. Like, I wanna be remembered as the guy who could cheat on his wife and she never found out. Like, that stuff is disgusting and it's not manly. And my point is that you already know that. You already know that. It's like you don't, and I don't, need to be convinced of that. I know what's good, I know what's manly, and I wanna be manly. I wanna overcome these giants, but so often in my life, I find myself running away from a fight, metaphorically perhaps, wanting to be brave, but seeing that I'm not. What are the giants in your life? You see, these giants, prevent us from becoming who God is calling us to be. What are the giants in your life? Unforgiveness. Not being able to forgive your dad for how he treated you. Right? Lust, the sin of pornography. Pride, like you won't listen to anybody. People are trying to teach you, you already know everything, thank you very much. Maybe you're a coward. Maybe the good Lord is calling you to be a priest and you're making all these excuses about why you wanna do something else. And What are the giants in your life that our Lord is calling us to slay? Please don't think that I'm talking down at you like here I am and I've slayed all these giants and now you need to as well. If you're hearing me say that, you're not hearing me. I'm exactly like you. I'm a, I'm a brother with a broken heart, man. And I find within me this cowardice. I find within me this desire to use women. I find within me this desire sometimes to just like look at porn. I find within me this desire, I don't wanna play with my kids, I just wanna binge on Netflix. I see it. Our heart is like a battlefield. On this one side, like the Philistine side, there is this desire to use, take advantage of, consume. But deeper than that, I know that the good Lord is calling me and he's calling you to be brave, to be strong, to be ferocious, to love valiantly, to forgive, to be a strong disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I won't be speaking a lot about pornography in this talk because uh, it, I give a big talk on pornography later on to the guys and the girls. But I have to say, that for me, that was one of the biggest lies ever inflicted upon me, the biggest Goliaths that was ever inflicted upon me. I was eight years old, it wasn't my fault. And brothers, listen to me, it wasn't your fault. You remember the first time you saw porn? Let me ask you a question. Imagine where you were, maybe it was in your bedroom, maybe it was at a friend's house, maybe it was at a store, maybe a relative's house. I want you to imagine that moment when you first saw pornography, and I wanna ask you a question. If Jesus walked into the room at that very moment, what would have he done? How would have he reacted? Now, often when I ask this question, men will say this, oh, I don't even wanna think about it. He'd freak out, I mean, he'd flip the table over, he'd 
he'd be disappointed in me. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what many of you also thought. Please listen to me. That's not what he would have done. What he would have done is he would have come up to you and he would have taken your head and he would have put it into his chest and he would have held you and he would say, I'm sorry that this happened to you. This shouldn't have happened to you. I'm sorry that this happened to you. Right? You and I have been born into a pornified culture. And let's be honest, it's one of the biggest things that's preventing men from being who God is calling them to be. I got hooked into this crap, and, and it just messes with your head. You get to a point where you start to just believe lies about yourself and about women. And to demonstrate what I mean, I'd like to share with you two quotations. The first comes from Playboy magazine in 1954, if you can imagine that, over 60 years ago. I want to share that quotation, then I want to share a quotation from John Paul II. And you tell me who's the man, and you tell me who you want to be like. Here's the quote from Playboy. He says, all sophisticated Playboys are interested in virginity. Most men realized that virginity is an unpleasant little matter to be disposed of early in life. In taking her virginity, you're actually doing the girl a service. Some may suggest that you're trying to deprive them of something, trying to take from them a cherished possession, but this is nonsense. Actually, you're giving them a new freedom, a means of enjoying life more fully. Some difficulties have arisen because of the confusion in female minds between virginity and purity. The two have nothing to do with each other, and it's important that you point this out at the proper moment. Thus, armed with our convictions, we're ready to begin. First, of course, we must select a suitable subject. Once we've found our subject, we're ready for the approach. Don't bother with non-virgins, because it robs you of that special pleasure of spreading the good news. Interesting phrase, huh? And that, after all, is what this article is all about. Listen to me, take this to the bank. The further entrenched in sin we are, the more rational insanity seems. The further entrenched in sin we are, the more rational insanity seems. So that if we're entrenched in sin and we read absolute garbage from Playboy like this, we nod sagely and tell ourselves that that's rather wise, but it's not. It's dribble. Compare that quotation to two lines from John Paul II. Are you ready? He says, a man is capable of fully accepting a woman's gift of herself only if he's fully conscious of the magnitude of the gift. And it's the duty of every man to uphold the dignity of every woman. That's a man. And what's more, you don't need me to convince you of that. You don't need like a cool little YouTube video with great special effects and sound effects to make you realize, yeah, I guess so. You know it. Like, like you know anything, you know it. Now, before I invite Father Mike Schmitz up, the two of us are going to share with you three ways we can elevate our lives in order to overcome those giants in our lives and be the men God wants us to be. I have to share with you a short story. Because I was the sort of guy who was just binging on porn, I was weak, I was taking advantage of women, I was never happy. My life was becoming more and more drearily predictable, boring and uninteresting, and I didn't know how to escape it. While I was engaging in this, someone else, this is a true story, okay, on the other side of the world in Texas, his name was Charlie. Charlie was a Christian and he wasn't feeding his head with rot like I was. And Charlie one day went to a house party. And at this house party in Texas, the parents weren't home and everyone was drinking. 
Now, Charlie was under 21, so he wasn't drinking. But as he sat there and looked around at all of his friends make idiots of themselves, he saw something that caught his eye. You see, a friend of his, Cameron, a, a girl, was standing with a group of her friends, just chatting, drunk. And while he was looking at his friend Cameron, a young man walks across the living room and starts making chit-chat with Cameron, starts, you know, hitting on her, inviting her up to the bedroom. Cameron, uh, you know, was drunk, so she didn't have her wits about her, and so she says, okay, and so she links arms with this guy, and they stumble off together while all of her idiot friends are hooting and hollering. At this point, Charlie has a decision to make. Do I be a man? Do I fight for my friend? Even though I'm afraid, do I stand up and say what's right? Or do I just totally wimp out and say something like, whatever, man, live and let live, it's cool. Thankfully, he didn't wimp out. Charlie tells me, he walks over to the stairs and meets the two of them as they were coming, and Charlie says, what are you doing? And the guy says, what do you think we're doing? We're going up to the bedroom and get out of the way. I don't know how Charlie said what he said next, uh, but it worked. He put his finger in this guy's chest, looked him straight in the eye, and said, that won't happen, actually. And the guy immediately dropped Cameron's arm and backed away and said something about not wanting to start anything. What happened next? Charlie took his dear friend, his drunken friend, by the arm, and he walked her up the stairs. And he went into that bedroom where that man was going to abuse her. And Charlie laid her on the bed. He took a pillow for himself. He walked out of the bedroom, he closed the door, and he slept across the doorway all night. Why? <laughs> well, it's obvious. If anyone wants to come for her, he's like, they gotta get through me first. Can you imagine the profound respect I have for Charlie when I tell you that Cameron, the idiot drunken girl, is now my wife and the mother of my four children? Eh, give it up for Charlie. Brothers, let me say it again. I, I hope I'm not boring you, but let me say the same message again. Who you want to be is who God is calling you to be. God wants you to overcome these Goliaths in your life, and it doesn't require you to suppress your desire. It requires you to become ferocious in a sense. It requires those desires to come forth in a manly way. As we begin to wrap up, we're going to have some time for worship at the end. I want to invite up a good friend, Father Mike Schmitz. Um, I just thought of this right now, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Oi. Oi, Aussie. Do you want to tell them the story about how you almost played Robin? No, no. You, you really don't? I was almost Robin in Batman Forever. True story. He's not making that up. <laughs> Go tell them. Okay, so here's the quick story. So my <laughs> sister, my oldest sister, she, um, she does wardrobe for different performing artists, and so she's kind of in the business. And I was 20, I think, years old. I was in college, and she said, hey, she knew I like comic books. She knew I like Batman. She knew I like Robin. She's there casting for Robin. You should try out. I'm like, okay. So I went there not thinking that I would get the part, but thinking that I would have a story out of it. And now Matt's letting me tell the story, so that's good. Um, and I showed up, and it was, this, it was a casting call. So basically, they call a casting call a cattle call. Because when you first walk in, there were thousands of guys who... That look exactly like you. Exactly. Yeah. And so and as you walk forward, they say, uh, you sit down. You can leave. You can leave. You can leave. Wow. You can sit down. You can leave. So I was like, okay. Meh. <laughs> walk by. And then it was like, basically, it started this round of callbacks. So they kept saying, hey, we like you. Come back for more. Come back for more. So there was the final callback, and they told us that this was the, it was down to 12 guys. So they said about 12 guys that they're going to pick from, but they wanted to film us to send to the casting, the, the director. So I was over with the casting director, the assistant casting director, and a camera guy. 
and they said, we want this Robin to not be like, you know, oh, golly gee, Batman. They wanted this Robin to be dark and brooding and like really emotional and troubled, disturbed. And they said, so we want emotion and raw passion out of you. I'm like, okay. So here's the scene. You're gonna set this, you do this scene with this casting director. We're gonna film you and you are a troubled teen. You got sent home from school and she's your mom and uh, you have a fight, go. And like, okay, so I'm sitting there and she comes in and the camera's going and we start having this argument and it gets like this escalation of like all this motion, like we're yelling at each other. This isn't this is like some casting room, hotel room or something. We're yelling at each other. And then I remember the end of the scene, like she's sitting down, I'm on the ground, like grabbing onto her hands. We're both crying and like, but mom, this kind of thing. And I'm like, where is this coming from? This is the weirdest thing in the world. <laughs> and, and we're like, had this moment of pause and she's sitting there, tears coming down. She's like, cut. <sighs> That was really good. And, and the, ca the assistant casting director, he's crying. He's like, yeah, that was good. And the, fi the camera guy is like, you guys, you, that was good. You know, I'm like, wow, this is, everyone cries at these things. Um, but then they said, you want to uh, audition for another movie? We really like you. We're also casting for a movie called Hackers. And we'd like you to audition for the main lead on that. And so that they, we did. And um, spoiler, I didn't get either part. Um, <laughs> But Hackers was interesting because uh, I didn't get Rob and I didn't get Hackers. Um, the guy who got the part for Hackers, he ended up uh, starring in that movie opposite Angelina Jolie. And he actually ended up marrying her. So if things had gone differently, <laughs> I could have been the first ex-Mr. Angelina Jolie. Yeah. So I'm glad he's a priest. What about you? There it is. Yeah. That's a, there's a story. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. So we want to talk about th three things really quickly, three ways to elevate our lives to become the sorts of men God wants us to be. And those three things are we want to elevate our faith, we want to elevate our friendships, and we want to elevate our entertainment. And so I'll say a few things and then I'll pass it over to you, Father. Elevate our faith. I alluded to this last night. You know, when I was a young boy, I thought that Christianity was intellectually bankrupt. Whenever I would approach a priest or my grandma or my mother with a question about God or hell or sin or virtue or how Jesus can be God and pray to himself or whatever, it was always answered with the, oh, it's mystery. And I remember thinking eventually, like, maybe it's not mystery, maybe it's just made up. I shared with you last night how at World Youth Day in Rome, I experienced the person of Jesus Christ and it changed my life. But at that point, I started reading the actual sources I should have been reading for these sorts of questions, these sorts of answers I was looking for. And what I've found is that Christianity is incredibly intellectually satisfying. That even though when I was a teenager, I would have these little one-liner quips, you know, like, well, who created God? That, you know? When I would actually study philosophy, read those who knew much more than me, I realized that objections like that were quite futile. Let, since I brought that one up, let me just respond to that real quick before handing it over to Father Mike. Asking who created God is like asking if your brother's a bachelor, what's his wife's name? No, if you understand the term bachelor, you understand he doesn't have a wife. And if you understand the term God, you understand why asking who created God is a stupid question. Because God is a metaphysically necessary being whose non-existence is impossible. So if that's God and you say who created God, you're essentially asking, oh yeah, well who created the uncreated creator? No one. No, that's the point, you know. So we can't spend time getting into all the ins and outs of this, but I just wanted to reaffirm that in you. I once heard Scott Hahn say, you don't have to defend the truth. Truth is like a lion. All you have to do is let truth out of the cage. And as I have grown in my Christian walk over these last 17 years, I found that all the questions I've had have either been very sufficiently answered there are some things which I still don't fully understand, but I can trust that they are explainable even if I can't. Yeah, and then when it comes to one of the battles, and this is what we're talking about, right, battling Goliath, one of, the world, uh, one of the battles we have to face as human beings, as Christians, as Christian men in this world, is not gonna be like, we don't take up arms to fight for, for Jesus, we, we, but we do have to be bold and courageous because one of the greatest weapons that the world will use against you and I in our culture right now is not even intellectual argument as much as it is 
uh, cynicism or contempt or disdain. Here's what I mean. Matt mentioned the, uh, what's called the argument from contingency, where it is liter it's literally impossible. This world, sorry, nothing could exist without God. It's impossible for things to exist without God. Here's what I mean. Um, question. This is a speaker. Is this speaker necessary? D meaning, does it have to have existed? No, right? Because it didn't have to exist, but it does exist. Um, the, uh, these shoes I'm wearing, do they have to exist? No, they could have not existed. Um, if you look around this entire place, none of this building had to exist. N this, con this country, this continent, the world, the stuff that is doesn't have to be. It's all what they call contingent. It's unnecessary. And yet it does exist, which means what? It means there must be some being that isn't itself contingent. It isn't that itself has to be, is necessary in order for all the unnecessary things to exist, right? This, anyways, it's great. If, you, if that intrigues you, please look it up and look more deeply into it. We had a debate between a, the, a theist, a Catholic philosopher, and an atheist philosopher on our campus. And that guy, his name's Dr. Dr. Rhoda, he presented the argument for con contingency, which is what Matt had said. And it's this great argument that is bulletproof in so many ways. What was interesting is the atheist philosopher stood up and he didn't even engage the argument. He didn't say, well, you know, the holes there are, he didn't say, well, the logic is flawed. He didn't say, well, all he did was he was like, <laughs> okay, so really? That's all he had to do. In, in, a, in a stadium or, or, or auditorium full of college students, in order to, to like pop the argument that this, again, bulletproof argument, he's able to pop in the minds and the hearts of all those students by just going like, but seriously, seriously, really? I mean, people once believed in Thor too, which is completely different, but he didn't say that and they didn't have to know that. All they had to know was really cynicism. And so the, one of the battles when it comes to your faith is going to be not only against the cynicism of those outside, but even that inner cynic that goes, ah, but really? If you have that question, I invite you to ask the question. Don't just sit there and say, really, but ask the question. Amen? Let me suggest three resources, or maybe more, we'll see how we go, that you can turn to to help grow intellectually in your faith. The first, I would highly suggest, if you haven't been there already, go to Catholic Answers. Their website is catholic.com. There's a cornucopia of audio and video and blogs right there for the taking. Pour yourself a cup of coffee. As Father said, if you've got a specific question, spend half an hour to an hour doing that. Secondly, uh, I wrote a little book on atheism. I just found out today it's actually in the gift shop. It's quite an easy read. If you want to, you could get that. Uh, thirdly, Father Mike has a terrific um, vlog, series of vlogs that he continues to do uh, called Ascension Presents. You want to? Yeah, so look up Father Mike Schmitz because you've done some great stuff, little bite-sized chunks on apologetics. You could just sit down in front of YouTube and binge on Father Mike. That's got to be good. Uh, and, then, and then finally, I have a podcast called Pints with Aquinas. So, you know, if you want to, uh, we discuss a lot of philosophical arguments in that too that you could subscribe to for free. Elevate your faith. Don't just be satisfied with the simple answers. If you have those questions, delve deeper. Believe me, much more brilliant minds than yours and mine have wrestled with these questions and have given, for the most part, really serious and credible and convincing and satisfying answers. Okay, secondly, and I'll let you take the lead on this, Father, elevate your friendship. Yeah, when it comes to friendship, the recognition is, so I grew up in Brainerd, Minnesota, and, but, and one of, but one of the things is when I, when I encountered Jesus as a high schooler, um, we didn't have conferences. Um, we didn't have really a youth ministry. And I was, I, as far as I knew at least, I was the only person my age who cared. I was the only person my age who was trying to follow Jesus. Maybe there were other people out there I just didn't know. Um, so I was alone. I, and so I basically, there's something good maybe that, about having to fight alone because you learn how to fight even when the world around you doesn't want to fight with you. But there's also something powerful about finding a true friend to fight alongside of. And the great thing about this, and Matt and I were talking about this earlier, is that um, when it comes to friendship, like true friendship, not, not, there's a bunch of different kinds of friendship, but the, the virtuous friendship 
is a kind of friendship that rarely talks about the friendship. Like, you don't find two guys who are really close, as, as brothers, who often talk about, like, isn't it great that we're brothers together? Isn't our relationship, our friendship is so amazing. It's like, we're like brothers. I know. We're, sometimes girls talk about that, like, we're sisters, and yeah, we love our sisterhood. That's wonderful, and that's great. But a lot of time for the guys, real friendship for us is not going to be us looking at each other. Actually, here's the image. It's not like this, like where Matt and I get to talk about our relationship, our friendship, and our, our brotherhood. It's this. It's we're both facing the same direction, running after the same thing. And, and C.S. Lewis says it like this. He says, there's this moment when you're racing after the prize. And for us as Christian men, that's the prize. Jesus himself is the prize, right? You're racing after the prize. And then you look to your, to your side and you realize, wait a second, you too? You're running too. And one of the scripture... Uh, scriptures in this that I just love is, we heard the story of David, right? We have the character of David. Here's a, here's a man who's ready to fight. He's ready to be a man. He's ready to be bold. After this scene, David meets a guy named Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son. And it says, in scripture it says, when Jonathan met David, he instantly loved him. And they became as brothers. He instantly loved him as he loved his self. Now, in our culture, what do we think? Oh, they had a bromance, right? I get it. Like, maybe it's a little questionable. No. Why did Jonathan instantly love David? Well, because of a little-known story that not a lot of us are familiar with came two chapters before the story that Matt read to us about David and how awesome David is. Here's how often awesome Jonathan is. In chapter 14 of 1 Samuel, it says, One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his armor-bearer, because the Philistines were always attacking the Israelites, he says, hey, come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he didn't inform his dad because Saul's outpost was out there. And basically what the gist of the story is, Jonathan saw the Philistines just like David saw the Philistines, mocking the kingdom of Israel. And so all chapter 14 is, is the story of Jonathan who says, I'm tired of this. Armor bearer, let's go. I'm not waiting for permission to fight. I'm not waiting to get asked to fight. I'm just going to go fight. And Jonathan had the same kind of heart that David had. So when he sees David, that's the guy who fights. Remember what happened in all of Israel? Goliath is challenging them, and they all are like, no, just rather hang out on this you know, hillside. David goes and fights, and Jonathan says, yep, just like that. That's the kind of man I want to be. That's the kind of man I am. That's my brother right there. You guys, at this conference, to elevate your friendships is to say, okay, I'm racing after Jesus. Who's, who's running with me? To look to your right and to your left and say, who can I run with? Who's the man who is willing to chase after Jesus no matter what that I can be brothers with? Yeah, that's awesome. I couldn't have said it better, Father. Thank you. I think another aspect of friendship and the type of friendship you're speaking of, sometimes you get this idea like, I got 5,000 friends. No, you don't. The sort of friendship we're talking about, God never meant us to have many friends, I don't think. I think the Lord's calling us to journey alongside just a handful of friends. And, and I heard somebody say this, that f having a true brother means being able to say to them, essentially, if you want to hurt me, here's how you could do it. In other words, being vulnerable with a brother, opening your heart up before him, not too quickly. You need to learn to trust him first and he you. But then showing him that part of yourself where, you know what, if you really wanted to take me down, you could do it. That's the sort of vulnerability that our Lord's calling us to. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Very finally, elevate your entertainment. Now, to me, entertainment is sort of like food you can become accustomed to eating really bad food. If you wake up every morning, go down to McDonald's, have a cigarette, eat your burger, drink your Coca-Cola, let's say you do that for five years, okay? And all you eat is junk food, fried food, fast food. Well, guess what? Like eating an orange or strawberries or, or you know, broccoli is gonna be totally unappealing to you. And you're gonna wonder why, how, how could anybody be interested in it? Similarly, if you and I gorge ourselves on poor entertainment, not just objectively, intrinsically evil things like pornography, but even vulgar sorts of films like Game of Thrones, which contains pornography, or other sorts of entertainment that's just sort of sophomoric uh, and unintelligent, and that doesn't cultivate a love for the beautiful, if you do that, then you won't be able to appreciate, uh, you know, 
like a, a poem from, uh, from, William, uh, from Wordsworth or, or from uh, uh, who wrote, Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost. You'll, you'll try to read it and be like, ah, I just don't get it. I think what our Lord wants of us is to cultivate our desire for sophisticated entertainment, which, as I say, cultivates a love for the true, good, and beautiful, and doesn't just numb us. Because very often we turn to entertainment not to be renewed, but to numb. We just flick, 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 Twitter, nothing. Instagram, nothing. Facebook, I got a like, I feel happy. Instagram, nothing. Twitter, nothing. Facebook, nothing. Instagram, I got a like. What are we doing? Now, I do it too. I'm not judging. Well, I am actually. We suck. We need to be better. That's the judgment. All right. Yeah, go. <laughs> and then, have you ever seen um, uh, Super Size Me? Remember Super Size Me? Morgan Spurlock, he's this guy who said he ate healthy, and then, as Matt said, he started eating McDonald's for every meal, and into week, like maybe two only, he was like, I'm beginning to crave McDonald's. So he actually changed his tastes. Um, and who here likes coffee? I like coffee so much. I didn't drink coffee until my last year of seminary, and I didn't even start with like coffee. I started with the, the, the white chocolate mocha. Like it's not really coffee. There's a little bit of coffee in there. It's a milkshake. And, but over the course of time, what happened is I like, I love the taste of coffee, and I love the taste of good coffee now. Why? Because I've opened my palate to the taste of what good coffee is. At first I didn't like it, but now I'm like, this. I'm so, drawn to this kind of idea. And your tastes can change. My little brother's just like this when it comes to his entertainment. My little brother um, is a musician, and he um, will walk out of a movie after watching it, and he'll say, oh, I loved, you know, I don't know about the plot, but I love the score, like the, the soundtrack. I'm like, oh, there was music in that movie? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't even pay attention. But he is a great musician who knows how to listen to music in such a way that if I'm sitting with him and we're listening to some kind of, like whether it's a classical music or a piano piece, because he just loves that kind of, or the violins come in, it's something beautiful, he can hear it in a way that I literally can't hear it. Because he's trained himself to be able to recognize beauty when he hears it. And now I could say, yeah, but I can like, when it's, good, when it's a good beat, I can recognize that. Of course you can. But there's something, there's something really human that reaches the divine, and I, that sounds so like abstract, but something human that reaches for the divine when we have the ability to recognize beauty. Yeah. And we can't recognize beauty until we train ourselves or to have, find someone who says, I'm, I'm with my little brother, I'm like, Maddie, teach me. Like, how, what, what are you listening for? And he's like, oh, well, this. Oh, now I know. And now I can appreciate something that I thought was kind of boring. Now I realize it's not boring. It's beautiful. What's Robert Sarah's new book on silence called? Silence. Is it called Silence? Yeah, I think it's called Silence. Against the Dictatorship of Noise. Yeah, yeah. There's a fantastic bookshop here on campus. If you want to begin to cultivate your love for the beautiful, go there and find a good book, one you think you'll be able to finish, and just read it, all right? Guys, I want to thank you so much for being here and for listening. Um, you guys are awesome. As we wrap up... All right, as we wrap up, I, I think Father and I, and if you know the Salve Regina in Latin, you can sing it with us. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You can just sit there and just be a part of the experience. But I don't think there's too many more manly languages like Latin. So we're going to just sing the Salve Regina as a hymn to our Blessed Mother, asking her protection and for her to lead us to Jesus, okay? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. You can stand. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dolcedo, et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus, exules fili a te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, ilos tuos misericordes oculos, Ad nos converte. Et Jesum, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis, o 
post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O pia, O, o dulcis virgo Maria. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, please quietly take a seat.